Hello, my name is Shahyar Shahyari, and this is a lecture based on my book, Retrolinear. The title of the lecture is Scalars in a Vector Space, a foray into fields. The scalars in a vector space have often been real numbers. Can they be anything else? To answer that question, maybe we should think about what we need the scalars to do. Scalars don't seem to be the important show in vector spaces. They seem to be a secondary item. That's actually not the case, as we might be able to discuss towards the end of these lectures. What do we need from scalars? We have to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide by non-zero scalars. If you look at the kinds of theorems we prove and the things we do with scalars, we should be able to divide by scalars as long as they're not zero, multiply by them, add them, and subtract them. And we can really replace R with any set that has these four arithmetical operations. I'm going to give a definition of a field of numbers. The field is a slightly more general concept, but this will do for us for now. We'll start with the complex numbers. And F is a subset of the complex numbers. Reals would be an example of that. The complex numbers themselves would be an example of that, but there would be plenty of other possibilities also. And then we call F a field of numbers if it contains zero and ones. It should be closed under addition. That means that if you take two elements and add them, it still should stay in there. It should be closed under subtraction, closed under multiplication, and division by non-zero elements of F. F, a subset of C, is a field if zero and one are there. And if X and Y are in F, then so are X plus Y, x minus y, x times y, and x over y as long as y is not zero. You can never divide by zero. In a field of numbers, what are these operations? The way I've defined them, f is already a subset of the complex numbers, so we actually know what the addition, a subtraction, multiplication, and division are, and those are the same as the complex numbers. So in particular, if f was the real numbers, it would have the usual operations of the reals. What are some examples of a field of numbers other than reals? The rational numbers are one such thing. What are rational numbers? The rational numbers are ratios of integers, things like two-thirds and five-eighths and so forth. If you add, subtract, multiply, or divide rational numbers, as long as you don't divide by zero, you get other rational numbers. Zero and one are rational numbers. Therefore, Q is a field of rational numbers. These fields are things that we can use as scalars. Instead of the real numbers, you could have a vector space with the scalars being just the rational numbers. That's restricting the scalars, saying you don't want all the real numbers, just rational numbers. You might say, why do you want to do that? If in your normal life, you usually approximate made real numbers with a decimal expression, like instead of square root of two, you say one point blah, 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 or instead of pi, you say 3.14 then you're really using only rational numbers because 3.14 is 314 divided by 100 is a rational number. Pi is not, but 3.14 is. And computers often do that. They approximate things with rational numbers. And if you do that, then you want to be able to know what kind of constraints you get by limiting yourself to the rational numbers. So there might be vector spaces with rational numbers as the scalars. Another example, actually a much more important example, is the field of complex numbers. If you're not familiar with them, watch my video on complexes as a vector space and as a field. You, you see complex numbers as the scalars for vector spaces. This is expanding the set of uh, scalars for a vector space. In fact, there's many good reasons why the complex numbers are a much more natural set of scalars than the real numbers are. One reason, for example, is that all polynomials have a root in complex numbers. So something like x squared plus one does not have a root if you're only looking for real numbers. But if you're looking in complex numbers, you do get an answer. You get i or, or minus i. And uh, in fact, that's true of all polynomials. If you write any polynomial, it might not have roots in the reals. There might not be a real number that makes it zero, but there will always be a complex number. And that ends up being a very important property of the complex numbers, along with other things that makes complex numbers actually the field of choice for what we use as scalars for vector spaces for mathematicians. The integer z, what about them? You can add two integers, you can multiply two integers, you can sub subtract two integers, and you get an integer. However, when you divide integers, you do not get an integer. For sevenths is not an integer. And so the integers is actually not a field. And so you cannot have z, the integers, as the scalars for um, a vector space. That's actually unfortunate because there's tons of times that we would have loved if uh, the integers were field and we could have them as scalars. In abstract algebra, you do try to do that. You don't get vector spaces, but you get something called modules. And they tend to be useful, but they're much more complicated objects than vector spaces.
Here's another example of a field of numbers. This field we read as rational as a joint square root of two. It's numbers of the form a plus b square root of two, where a and b are rational numbers. Again, the elements of this set are things of the form a rational number plus another rational number times square root of two. Something like two minus three square root of two is in here, as is four plus seven square root of two. While something like square root of three minus square root of seven is not. You can add these things. You add like terms. You can subtract them. You can also multiply these. You would have to expand it and pull like terms together. But at the end of the day, you get a rational number plus another rational number times square root of two. Maybe slightly more surprising, not if you remember your high school rationalization of denominators, is that you can also divide. You can certainly divide, but the question is, is this going to be of the form a rational number plus a rational number times square root of two? You do that by multiplying top and bottom by what we call the conjugate of the denominator for minus seven square root of two. Then in the denominator, we have a plus b times a minus b, and that's a squared minus b squared. That gets rid of the square root of two. If you do that and then simplify, you can write this as minus 25 over 41 plus 13 over 41 square root of two. This is again a rational number plus another rational number times square root of two. And this is actually the reason why we need a and b to be rational numbers as opposed to integers. This is a field of numbers, and it could be used as the scalars for a vector space. In modern algebra, abstract algebra, that's a useful thing. Now for something a little bit different. I don't actually want the lots of scalars. I only want the scalars to be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. I wanted to explore whether or not I can use them for scalars for a vector space. I'm going to call this set Z5. Can I do that? You might say. Of course not. This set is not closed under addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. Why not? Because 3 plus 4 is 7, and 7 is not in this set. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 minus 4 is minus 1. 3 fourths, what is that? None of those are elements of this set. So how could this possibly be a field? A, a field is a place where you can add, multiply, subtract, and divide by non-zero numbers. We have been looking at field of numbers, and those are some of the complexes. This one is not a field of numbers. In any case, at this, it seems like a dead end. But what I'm going to do is change the multiplication and addition. And we're going to change the addition and multiplication on, on this set of uh, scalars. How are we, are we going to do that? And what about subtraction and division? They will follow from addition and multiplication. If I know what addition and multiplication is, then I have a gateway to deciding what subtraction and division will be. But first about addition and, and multiplication, how am I going to do that? Here's some examples, and you might want to try to see what rules I'm using. For example, for addition, I'm going to say 1 plus 2 is 3. Well, of course, that's true. 1 plus 2 is 3. But 3 plus 4 is going to be 2, and 2 plus 3 is going to be 0. So think about that. Where did they, these come from? What about subtraction? 4 minus 2 is going to be 2. If you have 4 apples, you eat 2 of them, you're left with 2. But 3 minus 4 is going to be 4, and 1 minus 4 is going to be 2. Whatever this rule is, at least it's closed. But the question is that, is it a sensible rule, and is it consistent? Does it have the properties of addition and subtraction that we would like? What about multiplication? 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 4 is 2, and 2 times 3 is 1. Okay, maybe you figured it out by now, maybe not. Here's some divisions. 4 divided by 2 is 2, 1 third is 2, and 2 thirds is twice 1 third is 4. But 1 third is 2. You might want to stop the video and try to figure out what are these numbers and where did they came from. But whatever you do, don't show this to your parents because they might uh, not like you being misinformed about addition, multiplication, and division. Where are these from? Let's think about that. We'll start with addition and subtraction, adding and subtracting. The way I want you to think about it is put this 0 through 4 on a circle. When you want to add, you go clockwise. For example, 1 plus 2 is 3. You start at 1 and you go 2 units, you get to 3. But if you start at 3 and go 4 units, where do you go? From 3, you go to 4, that's 1 unit, to 0, that's another 1, to 1. And then 2, so that's your 4 units, and 3 plus 4 is 2. And of course, 4 plus 3 is also 2, because if you start at 4 and go 3 units, you get to the same place. 2 plus 3, if you start at 2 and go clockwise, you get to 0, so 2 plus 3 is 0. And what about subtraction? Subtraction, you go counterclockwise. For example, 3 minus 4, you start at 3 and go backwards, 4 units. You go to 2, that's 1 unit, to 1, second unit, to 0, third unit, and when you get to 4, that's 4 units, so 3 minus 4 is 4. And 1 minus 4, if you start at 1 and go 4 units back, you get to 2. Another way of thinking about them is that when you're adding A and B, A plus B is, in this new rule, is that it's the remainder of the usual A plus B when divided by 5. It's not 
the sum that we're interested in, but the remainder when you divide it by five. For example, three plus four is seven, but seven, if you take away all the fives in it, two remains. Two plus three is five, so it doesn't have a remainder when you divide it by five. And minus a, what is that? Minus a is the number you add to a to get zero. That's what negative numbers are defined as. Negative numbers did not join the sisterhood of numbers for a very long time. People did not consider negative numbers as a number because number was supposed to count something. What does it mean to negative three of something just seemed like they're, they're counterintuitive. But the definition of minus three is that it's a number that has the property that if you add to three, you get zero. If we have addition, we can also have subtraction. If someone asks you what's three minus four, you say, what's minus four. Minus four is a number that you add to four to get zero, and that's one. Minus four is one, so instead of three minus four, you have three plus one, and that's four. What about multiplying and dividing? The new AB is the remainder of the usual AB when divided by five, is the remainder when you divide by five. How do you define division? You do that by first deciding what dividing one by something is. One over A is a number. What number is it? Is a number that if you multiply by A, you get one. If there is such a number, then that's one over A. For example, in C5, two times three, the usual two times three is six, but the remainder when you divide by five, which is the same as taking out as many fives as you can, is one. And three fourths is two. Why? Because two times four is three. Two times four, four is eight. But the remainder when divided by five is three. Two times four is three, so three fourths is two. Or you could say three fourths is really three times one fourth. And one fourth is four because four times four is one. If one fourth is four, then three times one fourth will be three times four, and three times four is two, so three fourths will be two. A more general definition, not just for five, but for Zn. If n is a positive integer, then Zn is going to be the integers zero through n minus one, the set that has n elements in it, but they start at zero and end at n minus one. We define a new addition and multiplication. If you have two elements, to add or multiply a and b, you find the remainder when divided by n of the usual sum or product of a and b. So you do the usual thing you usually do, but you don't leave the answer. You take out as many n's as you can and leave the remainder and the remainder between including zero and n minus one. This is called addition and multiplication mod n. Now what's minus a? How do we do subtraction? Minus a is that element that when added to a gives zero. And a over b is an element, if it exists, that if multiplied by b, you get a. There are other notations for zn. In fact, the better notation is z mod nz. That's a little bit more cumbersome, and I'm not going to use it here, but for reasons that become clear if you take an abstract algebra course, it's actually a much better notation than z sub n. So let's look at an example. n equals 6, then z6 will be 0 through 5. Remember, it starts from 0, goes to n minus 1, and here we're doing things mod 6. So we're adding and multiplying, but then taking the remainder when you divide by 6. For example, 3 plus 4 is 1. Why? Because 7 divided by 6 has remainder 1. Minus 2 is 4. Why? Because 4 plus 2 is 0. 3 times 4 is 12, but that doesn't have a remainder when you divide by 6. So 3 times 4 is 0. And 1 fifth is 5, because 5 times 5, 25, has remainder 1 when divided by 6. So 5 times 5 is 1, so that makes 1 fifth equal to 5. But then what is one half? So one half would be a number that if you multiply by two, you get one. So let's multiply all the things in C6 by two and see which one gives us one. Two times zero is zero. Two times one is two. We didn't get a one yet. Two times two is four. Two times three is zero. Still not a one yet. Two times four is two and two times five is four. We'd never got one. So that means that actually in this system, one half does not exist. Because we can't divide by two, Z6 cannot be used as scalars in a vector space. Z6 is not a field. But what about our old friend Z5, the one I started out with? We can certainly add, subtract, and multiply. There's nothing that's going to stop us from doing that. We are always finding remainders when divided by five. We're always going to get something between zero and four inclusive. The only problem always is division. So the question is, can we always divide? If you want to take B and divide it by A, we can think of B divided by A as B times one over A. If you're going to be able to divide, we should have one over A for all A. If we have one over A for all A, we can also do division because then we can 
do b times 1 over a. In z5, let's see, 1 over 1 is 1. 1 over 2 is 3, because 2 times 3 is 6. But when divided by 5, the remainder is 1. 1 third is 2. And 1 fourth is 4, because 4 times 4 is 1 again. And so everything does have a reciprocal. We have 1 over a for everything. And therefore, we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide by non-zero numbers. So z5 is a field and can be used as a set of scalars for a vector space. So we can have vector spaces where the scalars are z5. The question is, which one of the ZNs can I use? ZN was 0, 2, and minus 1, and the operations of addition and multiplications were mod n, and subtraction and division come from the addition and multiplication. The theorem is that ZN is a field if and only if n is a prime. If n is a prime number, like 5, 7, or 47, then Z mod n will be a field. But if n is not a prime, it will not be. It's not that difficult to show that if n is not a prime, it will not be a field. It takes a little bit more work to show that if it's a prime, then it will be a field. We need fields to be used as scalars for vector spaces. Now we know that we can use z mod p as long as p is a prime number. If you have a vector space and if the scalars are from a field f, then you say that your vector space is over f. This explains wh why we would kept saying v is a vector space over r, because when we said v is a vector space over r, we meant that the scalars are real numbers. If you use a different set of scalars, we have to specify that. For first time reader, that's a red herring. You should just think about scalars as real numbers. One final example of a vector space over a field other than the reals, say that the field is Z7, seven is a prime. So Z7 consists of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And addition multiplication is mod 7. That is a field. And just like R3 would be a vector space over R, Z7-3, that means triples of elements of Z7, is a vector space over Z7. But, but then addition, scalar multiplication, and so on, will look a little bit odder. For example, 513 is an element of this vector space. 624 is another one. And you can find 2 times 513 minus 3 times 624. If you do 2 times 513, you say 2 times 5 is 3. Why? 2 times 5 in Z7 is 3. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times 3 is 6. So 2 times 513 becomes 326. 3 times 6 to 4 becomes 4, 6, 5. 3 times 6 is 18, but when you divide it by 7, the remainder is 4. So you get 3, 2, 6, minus 4, 6, 7. And then when you subtract, you get 3 minus 4 plus minus 1. But what's minus 1? It's a number that if you add to 1, you get 0. In Z7, that's 6. 6 plus 1 is 0. So 3 minus 4 is 6. And, and if you continue with that, you get 6, 3, 1. And all the operations are done in the field Z7. This is a vector space over Z7. This is the end of this uh, lecture. Like my video if you liked it. Subscribe to my videos if you want to be subjected to more undergraduate math videos on your feed. Keep hydrated at all times.